Nothing like having great listeners. Well, the broadcast is now streaming on the videos as well, folks. Sorry about that. But anyhow, our brothers and sisters, uh, and I'm talking. I'm not talking about our our regular lefty brothers and sisters. And I'm talking about those those folks who follow Trump. Those folks who follow the right wing. Sometimes we want to know why are they that way, and it's all by design. And the Powell memo is this document written in 1971. And out of the Powell memo, so much came about. But it was done in such a manner. And they explained how, how they were intent on doing it. How they were intent on confusing folks. How they were intent, and intent on going into university. So what I did is I said, you know what, as a precursor, to much of what we speak about and in order to earn the trust of others as we talk about these issues i want to make sure that folks understand the genesis none of this is by accident none of it is by accident that this particular document doesn't get a lot of play is also by design because when people figure out that they were just played their intent has always been to be played. Welcome to the, welcome to the chat, Alistair Waters. Oh, we were just cogs in a system. Just cogs in a system. And that is what we're going to lay out at the, at the second part after we go over the initial things that we're going to talk about. But last, last show, last program, I had two videos that I had not shown. And what I want to do is, because I, you know, they are potent in many ways. First one is Steele talking about the age issue with Biden. And I didn't do it justice, so I'm going to play that piece. Then I'm going to play the GOP candidate on John DeSantis just to get those out of the way. And then we're going to go into meat of what the show is about today. So here you go. Here you go. Here you go. You know what? I want the Democratic Party to hire Michael Steele as an executive consultant with them. You know, everybody has been making an issue about Biden's age, right? Uh, we, but guess what? We've seen Biden riding bikes. We've seen Biden jogging. We've seen Biden, yeah, uh, talking, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as Donald Trump is concerned, Michael Steele makes the obvious point in a very important manner. But it breaks down to this way. Donald Trump is just four years younger than, than uh, President Biden. He's obese and he has a problem not going up an incline, going down an incline where he can't keep his balance. And you know what? He speaks as if he has a mental conflict in his mind. There are so many well-placed narratives that can be used once they bring up age, once they open the door on that personal attack, for them to open it up and slaughter uh, any instance of Donald Trump. Of course, they may do it too well, and then he gets a younger candidate who is potentially not as caustic. Well, anyhow, listen to Michael Steele, and then we'll take it on the other side. Michael, could Republicans stray too far down this road? It, it's not like there are many years between President Biden and former President Trump, yet they keep on bringing up Biden's age. Yeah, sure. Uh, particularly given that the, the significant portion of their voting base are Biden's age. <laughs> so at a, at a certain point, you're, you're telling, you, you, you know, your, your base voters that uh, you're just not even competent to, to participate in the democracy anymore. I mean, look, it, it's the politics of the moment. I think Biden has handled this uh, expertly. He's done it with humor and he's done it with the show me stuff. This is what I'm doing. See if you can catch up. Um, you know, Donald Trump is, you know, sort of wailing from behind a podium, um, you know, and dealing with legal issues, um, not showing the kind of leadership that that Biden is showing. So there are some contrasts, comparisons and contrasts there that that the Biden team can put up. Uh, and people do forget. And, you know, again, it's part of how the Republicans frame the narrative. 
that Donald Trump is just four years behind him and, and, and obese by most medical standards, uh, out of shape. Uh, and, and we've got the same images of, of, of this, pre- of that president sort of, you know, having a hard time walking down a plank, not walking up, but walking down a plank. So look, you know, you want to play the game, play it carefully because there's enough evidence out there about Trump to, to show that, you know, age hasn't been kind to him either. Michael Steele nail it or what? And you know, he did it in just a matter of fact manner. Democratic Party, put this guy on your payroll for another reason. He knows some of where the skeletons are and how to get to certain a certain group of people. Please do it. Absolutely do it. The other the other piece that we had yesterday on yesterday's show that I didn't get to play was the DeSantis uh, and Disney. I think, uh, you know, and the reason I, I, I went, I want to continue playing these, uh, these guys is because we want people aware. You're hearing these things every day on the narrative on TV. I want you to have what I call the basal knowledge of what's going on. You take a look at uh, DeSantis and Disney and somehow he wants to look like the strong guy. Well, uh, Vivek took him out uh, earlier this week. Check this out. Vivek Ramaswamy is the GOP Republican presidential candidate, a millennial, who is running. He's a great talker. And make no mistake, this guy is a homophobe. This guy is historically, or he's, he's challenged by history. Let's be clear. This guy is no very smart cat that, that there is out there. I mean, in fact, he went on with, with uh, Lemon, and I think it's partially why Lemon got fired. Um, where he just didn't understand black history and had the nerve to say certain things to Lemon that I found surprisingly dumb. And you know, I don't use those words often, but were surprisingly dumb and showed he's intellectually challenged. That said, he made a very good point on this week, or rather on Meet the Press, where he really handed uh, DeSantis's tale to himself because DeSantis is all on this crony capitalism crap, this woke crap on Disney. And it turns out that some of the issues proper were created by whom again? DeSantis. It's actually the truth that DeSantis was in bed with Disney before he was able to turn on them and use them for their wokeness. I want you to listen to Vivek Ramaswamy, and then we'll take it on the other side. Let me ask you about the Disney dust off sure. with Ron DeSantis. On one hand, I assume you agree uh, with pushing back at Disney the way Governor DeSantis has rhetorically. Um, but is there a point where you think it uh, is too much to use government to punish business? Here's where Ron DeSantis really lost it here. He's gone on the wrong path. As he claimed, and this part actually sounded good to me, Disney should have never had crony capitalist lobbying related privileges in the first place. Here's the part he doesn't mention. One of those crony capitalist privileges was, and I think the most relevant one, was codified into law by none other than Ron DeSantis in 2021. Mm -hmm. So Florida passed this political anti-discrimination statute, which I applauded at the time, Mm -hmm. said if you operate internet companies, this includes streaming services like Disney does, that you can't engage in viewpoint discrimination. Now here's the funny, dirty little secret of that. They wrote into a last minute exception into that law for mm-hmm. anyone who also operates a theme park more than 25 acres in the state that's of Florida. Right. For, yeah, that's that's right. crony capitalism. And so the irony is Ron DeSantis, who's now railing against crony capitalism and rolling that back, yeah. was the one who actually passed that into law for the case of Disney. So I think that undermines the credibility of his crusade. I prefer to get to root causes rather than doing political stunts. Again. Vivek is no, I mean, I I know he's a businessman and people are going to want to play him up because he speaks eloquently and he speaks with authority and he speaks like he knows what he's talking about. But sometimes people who speak with authority and speak like they know what they're talking about, uh, they might as well have shut their mouth up on issues and let people assume they were smart because his issues on, on, uh, on racial issues, his issues on uh, LGBTQ issues are at best suspect, but definitely wrong. But the one thing he got right was the attack that he made on DeSantis. But then again, isn't even a dead clock right 
twice a day. So Vivek, we may be looking for the next right answer that you give as you run for president in your Republican primary. Absolutely so. Absolutely so. So, I mean, I wanted to get those two out. We were supposed to play those yesterday, but we ran out of time with the calls. Again, all the calls came in at the end. Folks, give us a call now. Uh, 713-526-5738. Extension numero dos. 713-526-5738. If you're interested in making a comment on this particular issue or on any issue we've been talking about. But do, 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 do realize that this is your show and you have... The, the option to change the subject if necessary. Anyway, title of the show today, as I mentioned, is Robert Wright has a debt ceiling solution and the Powell Memo is now our guiding document. Professor Robert Wright wrote an article that details how Biden should solve the debt ceiling issue. And we will explore the Powell Memo, the document under which we live. And some people say, well, wait a minute. I thought what we lived under was the Constitution, to which I say, uh, dream on, dream on. I mean, we live under the semblance of living under la Constitución, the Constitution. But the reality is we live under a document created by a who would eventually be the leader of the Supreme or on the Supreme Court, Supreme Court justice. Anyway. Robert writes on how to solve the debt ceiling, and, and he makes it quite clear. And let me go ahead and, and point out what he said. He said, my advice to Biden on debt ceiling face off with GOP, pay GOP. I said GOP. Oh, maybe that's kind of poetic just like GOP. Welcome, Eric Hayes. Solution? Huh, I don't think. And oh, Okay, we'll go ahead with that. And it says, a debt ceiling that prevents the federal government from honoring its existing financial commitments violates the Constitution. When you hear an economist like Robert Reich says that, you kind of know where he's going. If House Republicans refuse to raise the limit on the amount of money America may repay on what it owes, the deceptively named debt ceiling, they might force the United States to default, pushing interest rates into the stratosphere and shaking the world economy, says Robert Reich. President Biden rightfully says that raising the so-called debt ceiling should not be negotiable. And he's right. It should not be negotiable. It's monies that were spent already. Uh after all, Democrats joined Republicans during the Trump administration to raise it three times, even as Trump and the Republicans enacted a major tax cut for big corporations and the wealthy that caused the nation debt to soar. And I know people get tired of uh, those of us who always talk about the wealthy and the, the corporations, but the wealthy and the corporations, that's where our problems lie. Yet now, Kevin McCarthy and his band of Republican radicals are demanding that in return for their agreement to raise the debt ceiling, Biden and Democrats make drastic cuts in programs Americans rely on in everything from the public safety to the health care to education. My advice to Joe Biden, ignore McCarthy and Republican radicals. Mr. President, your oath to uphold the Constitution takes precedence. As the supreme law of the land, the Constitution has great weight than the greater weight than the than the debt ceiling. Section four of the Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution states that the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. A debt ceiling that prevents the federal government from honoring its existing financial commitments violates the Constitution. So, if House Republicans refuse to raise the debt ceiling, you are obligated by the U.S. Constitution and your oath of office to ignore the debt ceiling and continue to pay the debts of the United States. Should they wish, let the radical Republicans take you to court. Even the Republican radicals on the Supreme Court will like to support you. No originalist interpretation of the Constitution could read that document differently. The Constitution makes it clear that Congress's power to borrow money does not include the power to default on such borrowing. The original intent of the drafters of the Constitution in 1787 was to give Congress a power to tax and borrow, to pay debt, and to provide for the common defense of the public welfare. 
As Alexander Hamilton wrote in the Federalist Number 30, the power to tax and borrow was established to ensure payment of debt or to prevent a default. The second founders who amended the Constitution after the Civil War explicitly forbade Congress or anyone from repudiating or defaulting on the debt. The Republicans want to lure you into a cynical game, Mr. President. The nation needs you to play hardball. Let's go to Joe, line number one. Come on in, Joe. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great. How are you doing? I am doing fine. Talk to me, my friend. Talk to me. Oh, man. Where to, where to begin? <clears throat> um, I heard um, I tuned in this morning. And I'm very happy, you know, to, to, to be calling. Uh, I love uh, feedback and, um, um, you know, that KPFT is back to taking calls and public discussion. Um, but, but I was disappointed to hear really just a, just a, a, a litany of, of Democrat halt talking points, right. And you, you had like the highlight of cable news, right. Uh-huh. And, and kind of we're driving those points home, but there's really no, there's, there's no, no bigger threat to the American stability than cable news, you know? And, I, and I think that, Many of your ideas, you know, they, 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 they have merit, but think about it. You, you, know, you say that the corporations who are made up of people, those are the working people of America. Yes, they are. And wealthy individuals, wealthy individuals, you know, they need to be taxed more. But I, just doing a quick calculation, the number of, well, very wealthy individuals and the number of corporations is minuscule compared to the number of people who do not pay taxes, any taxes. Or uh-huh. just a irrelevant amount of taxes. So it 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 it, 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 it just um it's not going to work out. That, you know that you're not if, even if you confiscated the wealth, the profits of all the corporations, and ninety uh-huh. percent of the wealth of the of the elite, right? It's not going to be nearly enough to come up with you know our <clears throat> our yearly budget expenses, right? Uh-huh. Think of it like this. If, if for the last 20 years, my credit, my Amex credit card never sent me a bill and I just ran it up and ran it up and ran it up every year. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And this, that's kind of where we are right now. Eventually, eventually Amex is going to call mm-hmm. and I might have to sacrifice. I might have to sacrifice some things to get them paid off. Right. And, and at a time when, you know, people are calling for free health care and they're calling for free college and they want this, that, and the other, programs, programs, programs. On the other hand, we got to pay this credit card off and it's bad. Right. It's really, there's, you know, so I don't know. I'm, can I, can, can I, can we enter, can we have a conversation? Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, let, let me, let me put it this way. First of all, um, you, you just, you just told me that I am using a whole lot of talking points from the democratic party and also from MSNBC. Let me first correct one thing there. Okay. I use snippets from MSNBC, CNN, even Fox news to, to make a point. I generally enhance points that I consider either absolutely wrong or points that I can materially show, uh, is not the narrative is incorrect. That's the first point with regards to, um, with regards to, uh, being any part of the, I think you would have heard me if you listen to my program often, which I hope you do, which I also want to hear your pushback when you come on air, you'd see that I am no, uh, let's say democratic, uh, flunky that just wants everything for the democratic party. I'm a progressive person that has no interest in party. It so happened that the democratic party right now is the one that gives itself a, a, a place where progressives can exist. It used to be the Republican party back during civil rights, etc., that had the progressive wing, if you will, that did, that moved the country forward. Now that said, you made a statement as far as, uh, if you take all the money from the rich people and take all the money from the, uh, from the others that, that there's not going to be near enough to pay the bills that we have. Very important point you made there. Extremely important. Unfortunately, it is what we have been taught. And one of the reasons today I wanted to start with the Powell memo, or not start with the Powell memo, had the Powell memo on, is to show the orchestration of the misinformation, not by Fox News. Fox News is just one of the many institutions that that present information that would have an intelligent person like you. Because let me tell you something, based on the information you have gotten all of your life, what you've said is actually accurate based on that information, sir. But here's the deal. Unfortunately, it's not true. 
first of all, when we talk about income, what we did with our system is we divided income in a very special way. And the special way was this. You, are you, do you work, sir? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. You, are, you get what I call either a salary or wages. Now, rich people don't get salaries and wages. So when they give you that number that says, oh, my God, rich people, there are not enough rich people to pay the bill. And then they add up all the income from rich people. Guess what happens, sir? It turns out that rich people make a little bit of income because that's not where their income and wealth comes from. When you hear that 1% of America, uh, less than, that, the first, that the top five billionaires in this country owes, uh, owns more capital than the bottom 50% of all of America, those numbers are not false. They are real. And there's, they had a genesis. They start... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Sir, would you, would you, would you have a, would you then, would you liquidate that capital? No, that's not. Look, those. No, no. That I, let me answer your question because that's a very intelligent question as well. I cannot. We, that's not how our system works. Those folks got that money legally. In other words, they, they, they got the laws passed from the foundation of our country. They got the laws passed that made certain people have an advantage in making money. Let's go, let's go, go give an example. If, if you don't mind telling me, what kind of work do you do? I work for big oil. You work for big oil. Okay. And uh, are you an engineer? Or are you a roughneck? What are you? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bean counter. You're a bean counter. Okay. So um, you, you figure out how much money your, your company makes. It said, well, not, well, you're probably within a, a whole team that does that. You're materially important to that company to count the beans, if you will. There are those that are materially important to clean the tanks where the oil is saved. There are those materially important for, the, for that person who brings the ship in. It's a, a lot of folks are involved in making that enterprise. Now, you have some sort of fixed salary and you may get a small bonus at the end of the year. But to understand the also profits, stock. say that again? Also stock, I also, also stock. stock options. Yeah, right. But compared, what, what, what isn't usually uh, somebody don't quite see is the extent the, the, the 0.1% in your company makes off of the labor that you yourself produce. In other words, you sell your labor for cheap when we're talking about the profit margin, uh, get to get a barrel of oil out of the ground is about two dollars in Saudi Arabia. Okay, we no, buy it at a no, hundred. No, no. Say that again. False. That went up. False. Okay, That's but a, yeah, it's, it's false. Okay, but what I'm saying, it's 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 it, cheap. It, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. You go ahead. It, it, you go ahead. It, 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 what you're forgetting about is is they have to weather. They have to weather, you know, hard economic times. Sir, I know. <laughs> trust me. I really, I, sir, I really know all of that. And by the way, the only time uh, oil has ever gone where there's negative profits, technically speaking, is when we had uh, oversupply of oil. We had to pay people to hold oil during the pandemic. But every time oil is over three, four bucks a barrel, it's a profit. But we, we, we don't need to go there right now because I got uh, the calls are stacking up. But I want to tell you this, um, Joe, I, I beg of you to keep listening to the program and keep contributing to the program because you give me the option to explain some of these things. And, and I ask you not to take what I'm saying at face value or through the corporate lens that we have given the Powell memo. I ask you to I understand. fact check I, everything I, that I'm talking you, about. You know, I understand it, and it, this is this is just you and me talking. I've been calling, I've been calling you for years. You know, you, you I know you, you you will possibly remember talking to Joe or Joe Big Oil or right, you know, right, right. But but uh, and I will continue to listen. Don't worry. But but you know uh, what I worry is that the, I see the roots of like Bolshevism here in the United. No 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 no. I don't believe in that, sir. I mean, it's not that. It really is. It, it's the abuse of the corporate state that I'm against. Okay, and that is nothing more, nothing less. I believe in profits. I've had my own companies. I've given up my company to do this here. Okay, so I, I am, a, you know, I believe in that. But anyway, I thank you so kindly, Joe, for calling. Keep listening. Keep calling. All right. We'll do. Talk to you soon.
Take care, brother. Let's go to Matt. Linea numero dos. Line number two. Come on in, Matt. Uh, Mac. M-A-C-K. Sorry. I, oh, yeah, M-A-C-K. Come on in, Mac. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Good morning. Yeah, so uh, I guess what I wanted to know, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but it kind of relates to everything. Um, so Kevin McCarthy is the Speaker of the House, but according to the deal that he had to make with his own caucus in order to make that happen, I mean, I think only like one person or maybe two people can object. And then, uh, you know, that puts his position in jeopardy. And all of a sudden they have to vote Speaker of the House again. Yeah, I think it. I think they got it down so, to like four or something like that. But you're right. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I heard initially that it was five and then they negotiated down from there. So, yeah, maybe right. it's four. But I thought it was less than that. But anyway, um, I mean, if that's the case, then that puts him in like basically pro- political peril all the time. And the other caucus, the Republicans are always trying to come up with things like this whole thing with the debt season. This is just a way for them to put Biden in a jam to where he has to compromise on things that he doesn't want to compromise on, you know, right. whether or not that works is, is another thing. So, I mean, he's got a razor thin majority to stay speaker. Then why don't they just put McCarthy in the jam? And then, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure there are some issues out there that they can split that, that, not going to want to debate openly. So why aren't we doing that? We actually, we, we do have him and uh, believe it or not, McCarthy is in a jam with this debt ceiling debate. Now, the thing about it is I, I, I saw a piece uh, by, I don't remember his name, uh, the one of the pundits on one of the channels last night. And they said, look, all of this is a, uh, is a kabuki theater that we know at the end, these guys are going to come to some agreement. The idea is who is going to suffer the most. And I think what Robert Reich, the paper that I read in the beginning was saying is we don't even need to make this a kabuki theater. We just have to use the constitution, the, the 14th amendment of the constitution that states that we are responsible for all our debt and therefore not passing the debt is constitutional. Constitutional and the, in effect, the president just says, "Hey, United States government, pay all your bills." This because remember, increasing the debt is just a numer- is just a statement, nothing more. People think, "Oh, there's some mathematical well, thing that occurs." It's just a statement. Debt, debt, yeah, I hear you. Excuse me. The debt ceiling limit thing was a political ploy in the first place. Yes, back World War One times. But yes, all that aside, so. I, I hate to say it, but w- the way things have been going the last few years, I'm pretty cynical about what's constitutional and what isn't constitutional. I think. Oh wow, you're I, you're so right. While, <clears throat> most of us who have been alive for a while have a sense of what the Constitution is, but with the majority that they have on the court now, who knows? You so know, even if Biden tried to pull that card and say, "Hey, that's unconstitutional," that goes to the Supreme Court. Who knows what they're going to say? Wow. Um, you're, you're, you're right about that. You're so right. Let me, let me tell you, interestingly, I don't even, you know, I, there are a lot of people who always talk about constitution and have all this faith in the constitution. And as much as I said, uh, as Robert Wright says, uh, Biden has a constitutional way out in reality. Yeah. You use the constitution when you need to use the constitution and, and then the constitution is just there. I, I, I'm not particularly fond given what the constitution has meant to folks like myself anyhow, but that said there, there's an option as far as, as, as far as holding down the fort on McCarthy, uh, if the Democrats choose to do that, they could uh, exactly, as you said, they could make the pressure be on McCarthy instead. Yeah, that, that's my point. And, and I don't want to, I don't want him say that I don't, you know, respect or revere the constitution because I do, you know, I'm just mm-hmm. saying from a practical standpoint, you know, there are a lot of things that I believe are true in the world, but if somebody faces you with a gun, then you have to recalculate for the tactical circumstance that you're in. Exactly. Right. I think exactly. That when people who care about the constitution and what it has historically mean, meant and how it has historically changed, when we talk about it, then we mean one thing and we'll act certain ways. But I, I think that, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it, the Republicans and so-called conservatives in general, they, especially over the last like 30 years, they haven't shown me that they believe in that. They say that they do, but their actions and their statements, you know, don't match up to that. So that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know that we can practically say, well, you know, we can just say the Constitution says this is, you know, this is unconstitutional. Well, it says a lot of things. But if you have people who have the power to just ignore it if they want to, and they do, then you have to come up with other ways. And so that's what I'm saying. Maybe 
they need to figure out a way to put McCarthy in a jam and maybe force the Republicans to put somebody else as speaker that we can deal with. Anyway, Look, that's, that's what I Matt, that's what I, I, I hear you uh, clearly. Thank you so kindly for calling in. Your voice have been heard in the entire area. My, actually, in the entire world, sir. Thank you so kindly for calling in, uh, Matt. Thank you, sir. Good, have a good day. Uh, you too. All right, let's go to Johnny. Line number three. Line number three. Come on in, Johnny. How are you doing this morning, Johnny? Good morning, my brother from another Talk color. to me, my brother from another mother. <laughs> color and mother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Go ahead. Uh, I, was starting, I was starting to smile and grin when I started hearing your first caller, Joe. Because I know when people like Joe start complimenting you or our side in general, that's that's just a signal that they are in fact Republican. And he says he was a bean counter, I guess an accountant. Well, here's yes. some numbers for you, Mr. Accountant. One billion dollars when you divide that by two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is approximately five times the amount of the median salary in the US, in other words, the salary that a doctor might make. You take a billion dollars and you divide that by the yearly doctor's salary for some doctors. Guess how long it would take for that doctor to spend that money? 4,000 years. So when Bernie proposes a wealth, ta a income tax of 100% for those above a billion dollars, he's not saying you're taxing the billion. He's saying you're taxing... Uh, Nine, uh, you're you're not taxing the nine hundred ninety nine billion at the one hundred rate. You're taking only a hundred percent of one million dollars, because ninety nine uh ninety nine million nine hundred ninety nine million means you got one million dollars that you really shouldn't be having. Actually, I would be more strict than that, and a million dollars, uh, that takes. Uh, let's see, I wrote it down here. Two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars salary. It would take four years for a doctor to make that kind of money. And yeah. if you multiply that by a factor of twenty, it would. Uh, I mean, a factor of five, because it's five it's five times the amount of median salary for everybody else. That would take most of the average Americans about twenty years. So here's the proof of the pudding. The bottom line is uh, Eisenhower, a Republican. President, back in the early 1950s, under Eisenhower, we had a, a progressive tax code. And guess what? We didn't bankrupt the American people. Well, actually, we had Johnny, the economy does better because uh, when, when you don't allow the accumulation of capital, it means that money is recirculating in the economy. And, and an economic yeah. system is based on the, the circulation of money in the economy. So that is an important statement. But I, I want to I go even a bit further than you said there, right? Uh, we uh, we have to remove the indoctrination from most Americans that believe that a billionaire earned that money. They earned it legally based on a rigged system. But as far as the work, the intellect, and the uh, and and what it took to raise that billion dollars, it wasn't that of the billionaire. It was the collective work of everybody else it's the skimming of everybody and and the thing about it is before we talk about taxing the rich i think what we have to get to understand is that the rich did not legit did they, while they legitimately earned whatever they have because it's whatever people were willing to pay that it wasn't deserving based on what they contribute to society we have to we have to decouple that they that the rich somehow earned that. And until you are able to decouple that, you would get a brother like Joe. And and, and I think Joe, I look, I like Joe. I, I'll just say because Joe doesn't come on here and scream about you, you this or you that. He, he, you can have a conversation. And you have to remember, I was talking about the Powell memo today. This stuff sent out some very indoctrinative stuff that seems correct. That's how we got the Cato Institute. That's how we got the Heritage Foundation, etc. So I love to, uh, he gives us the, the opportunity to be able to collectively educate ourselves. Go ahead. Okay, so anyway, I was about to disagree with you, and then you corrected yourself once again. <laughs> you Here we correct. go. That's why I listen sometimes, brother. Listen. 
I was going to make those points, but then you're coming to the quick, but that's okay. Uh, the, the important point that you made, that you corrected on, is that these people who possess a billion dollars, they didn't earn it. Right. They use a case from a law professor from a 1980s uh, series. The law right. The well, Johnny, our phones are taking up. So, I mean, you know I love you, but I need to go to another call, okay? Thank you, brother. Don't forget. Peace. Eisenhower is bankrupt us. We actually had an economy that worked. All right. Thank you, brother. Peace. Let's go to Lewis, line number four. Lewis, line number four. Come on in, Lewis. How are you doing? Hey. Are you there, Lewis? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, you can talk, Lewis. I, they j just need to hang up line number three, but line number four. There you go, Lewis. Talk to me. Yeah. Uh, so I saw that we were, were paying like $561 billion in just interest on this last... On the debt, uh, yeah. So to speak. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what are your thoughts on... Are we spending too much money, or do you think we need to spend more than what we are spending now? Even like in what what kind of capacity? Okay, let some, let me explain because that's a very important question. All right, why do we have why do we have an interest payment exceeding three hundred billion dollars every uh, every year? Why do we have that? In your opinion, because we we've, we've spent more than we than we're uh, making. And how do we make money? The government. Uh, well, of course, we, we tax. Um, All right. And well, what have we done every time we... Tax. Right. And what have we done every time we get a Republican, uh, a Republican Senate, House, and President? What happens every time we get those three together? Uh, I think it, you have the same problem on both sides. You don't have a... I know, but I, I, I'm asking a specific question about that. I think it's an important one no. that I... Uh, okay, let me tell you. Probably, yeah, go ahead. They cut taxes massively. If you can look under okay. George W. Bush, cut the only person that did different was the one who said, "Read my lips." He did the very. I wrote a book on this. He did the very. He is the president that did the right thing. In fact, he made Clinton look good by starting off the recovery into a balanced budget. Bush started it. Clinton finished it. To get a balanced budget. Now, here's what I'm where I'm, I'm driving at with this with this this here. Okay. Uh, our huge deficits didn't start with Carter. We had a forty billion dollar deficit under Reagan, where which was explosive in those days. Okay, explosive. I wrote about all. I chart. I have all this charted in my book, etc. It's explosive, but we we don't have people that go in detail and tell the story. What? What Democrats do is tax and spend. You can, I'll, I'll, I think Democrats can be accused of doing tax and spend, but they, I, I think for the most part, they do good spending, but we can debate that. But what Republicans do in power is they cut taxes and spend. They don't reduce their spending, but they, they do cut taxes. And what we have shown, and all of this you can see in charts, perfect charts that you can read, right? It shows what has happened to our budget constantly because we have not appropriately taxed. When you hear about the, the people who are able to accumulate billions with capital appreciation and much more. And at the same time, let me tell you what happens, sir. What happens is the following. Uh, the American people are given a bill. That, that $500 billion in, in, ta in uh, interest now that the, the Fed rates has gone up that you're speaking about as well, right, is the following. Yeah. We go ahead and ha we don't change how much we spend because we pretty much can't accept if we decided to reduce the defense budget, but we don't. So we borrow the money from wealthy people who buy bonds and we cut their taxes, which means we have to borrow money because they are no longer paying those high taxes to borrow. So we are paying them twice. The rich people get paid with the tax cuts. The rich people get paid when we loan them money. And that $500 billion that you're talking about, that doesn't go into your pocket or my pocket. That goes into those bondholders' pockets. Those Wall Street guys that are yeah. selling our bonds, it goes into their pockets. Go ahead. I look at the... Uh, um the amount of money that are, that there even is in the in the world or in the greater sense of things to say 
if you took the entire stock market and sold it, it, it only sold for $30 trillion. And once you sold to the stock market, you have to have somebody that buys it. And, and, and it's not like there's going to be a lot of poor people lining up to buy stock. That's not how it runs, though. That's not how it happens, though. That, you see, and, and that, that is what... And I'm if sorry. There's only four trillion in circulation, and there's only three mm-hmm. trillion that we can account for. Me, right? Which means there's a trillion in people's mattresses all across the United States. No, let me let me explain yeah. something, sir. That is what. The, remember, yeah. I was talking about the Powell memo today. That is what they would like you to believe. I have I have people in the chat who talks about money. They are what I call monetarists. The reality is money. It, uh, given that we have a sovereign it's currency, I mean, it's all it's all on paper, though. Right. right. It's not really. Not exactly. So, I get, I get that. so here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Though. It's important what I'm going to say here. It's important. Sure. The only limit we have in money is if we didn't have the productivity for those who want to buy things to buy. There's nothing. And we could we could print money as long as there is productivity in this country. Don't hear, let anybody hear you say that. But it's the truth. Uh, you can, as long as you have something to buy uh, that you want something, as long as it's there for you to buy, we can keep inflating the dollar. There's absolute, but that's not even what I'm talking about though. What I'm talking about is more profound. And it's that I, I, you heard the discussion with Johnny and Joe before, where we talk about whether the billionaire has earned yeah. what they have. Okay. So if, yeah. if we, if we start from the premise that the billionaire hasn't earned what they have, and we start from the premise that we have a, what, $4 trillion uh, budget or uh, what, what, whatever the budget may be. Right. And uh, we really do not have a problem. The problem is manufactured by our inability to take back into our coffers that which others with privilege take. And it's hard for people to grasp that because we don't learn it that way. We learn that somehow those wealthy people, there there are not enough of them. Their money is not in wages and income at all. But they're asking us as the common person, do you have a house, sir? Do you have a house? Yeah, I do. That's that's my point. If if you took every billionaire in the United States and you totaled all of their assets, including the shirt on their back, they only have eight trillion dollars total. No, they don't. Again, so that is. You, remember, you yeah, have to separate. If you, if no, you no, 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 sir, every, sir, sir. That's I guarantee you. Million dollars. That's everybody's sir. billionaires, including all their assets together combined. Sir, again. Yes, sir. That's how people want you to look at it as if these are static numbers. Here is it. We, there's asset and there's money in circulation. The economy. <laughs> you can look at the appraisal and see that, 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 that everything that they have, including the money they have in the stock market. But that's not how it works. But it I is, need you. I mean, it's every trillion dollars total. That is the total. That's not how it works, sir. Fictitious. That's not a sir, that's been put in and said, hey, that's what it is. That's what no, it is. sir, that's like, not how it works. Sir, it could you listen for a second, please? That's right. Okay. That's not how it works. That's not how an economy works. An economy doesn't work on the total value of assets. The economy works the following. The motion and right. movement of money. That's how it works. Correct. Right. Okay, it doesn't matter, assets, et cetera, doesn't matter what happens. However, if you accumulate assets that removes the ability of others to create income, you get the status that we're in right now. It's the hardest thing to teach because of the misinformation that's been going around on our economy since our inception. I'm, I'm trying to say it's not about selling the assets of... You asked me if I had a house, if I have a $200,000 house, Let's explain that. Give me a chance to explain that. Dollars, I won't be able to pay that off in any in any regard. Okay, hold one second. Let me. My money. Give me a chance to explain this to you, and then I, I need to go to the la- the other caller. But okay. here's this: two hundred thousand, and then six million. Go for it. Okay, you have a house. What do you do every year with that house? What do you have to pay every year on your house, which is your largest asset value? What do you pay on your house? Something called. Property taxes, taxes right? And taxes and insurance and all the utilities. Yeah. Okay, so stop right there. That's what you pay. If we were to ask everybody who has assets, I repeat, if we were to ask 
everyone who has assets to pay, just like you pay on your asset, your home, if they paid on their assets, which may be stocks, which may be something else, if they paid that, we have to get out of the framework of protecting those who have never protected us. If you own a home, you own a car, you own all these things that are in fact assets and you don't complain about paying your taxes on your assets, but the wealthy who own assets as stocks, they don't pay any taxes on that. But guess what? The wealthy who also manages your money, if you have stocks, they also take a property tax on your thing called a commission yearly. So what I'm saying is the unevenness of laws put you at a disadvantage. How possibly can we continue to defend us being at the short end of the stick? The stock broker charges you a commission on your asset, not on your profits, on your assets. The state charges you taxes on your asset, but we have a protected class that neither pays social security on their asset, neither pays Medicare taxes on their asset, neither pays anything on their assets. And then those of us who are paying are defending them. Do you, see the, do you see where all this money could be coming from that's there? They're asking us to pay, but they don't? Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's math. Maybe we should just bankrupt them completely and make them it's, uh, have... I, it's, it's, again, how much, what percentage do you pay on your, on your home? Has it bankrupted you? 4%. If we ask them to do the same, and Bernie has asked for less than that, but if we ask them to pay the same on all our assets, how is that going to bankrupt them? That is, the, that is a false narrative that they want us to believe, sir. But they pay 4% on their, on their property taxes as well, but their property But they don't pay it on their assets. You pay it on your car. Most of, their, most of your assets is in your home. Most of their assets are in stocks. Why don't we ask them, my brother, to, to have the same rights that we, or rather, that we mu- they must go through what we go through as well? That's all. We're not asking for anything magical. We're just asking for them to pay their share as well. That's where all. Does that money go to? Say that again. And where does that money go to when they... Let me tell you what happens then. We, all, of our, all of our taxes go down, number one, because I don't think you understand the level of assets these people have. That's number one. And number two, uh, the economic impact is larger because money is spent by those who have less of it, so they spend more of it. Those who have a lot of money do magical things with it. They, they put it in a bank in Switzerland. They put it in a bank in, in other places. Uh, on, on under the premise of creating investments, but now that not even that that they do. But I got to go to my last caller, um, Lewis. But I wanna, sure. what I I want to ask you to do, Lewis, is keep listening to the show because we talk a lot about these issues and everything that I say here is uh, I ask you don't take it at face value. Just look it up. That's all. But what happens I is did. we don't. <laughs> That was my point. Eight trillion dollars is the total amount of assets. Of but I, what I'm saying is, you're not treating an economy as what it is. Assets are not an economy at all. Assets are not an economy. But we'll talk about that another time, Louis. Thank you so kindly for calling. I got to go to Richard. Okay, sir. Sure. Richard, okay. come on in. Have a good day, sir. You too. Bye-bye. Richard, come on in. Hello. Yeah, you're on, Richard. Hello. Yes. yes. Yeah, I just I just wanted to point out that. Uh, you know, just real quick for all these guys who are talking about, you know, taxing the rich and stuff is I'm a capitalist. I own my own business for 17 years. I sold, I'm also like Joe was in the oil service business. I own my own company, but oil dropped to zero. They were giving oil away. I yes. shut my company down. I'm about to retire. Now I'm a consultant. But anyway, mm-hmm. so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also involved in big oil. But That's not a, I, I don't have a problem with that. You know, I'm, I'm saying this. I look at it as a, a I'm a capitalist. I mean, you said you own your own business. You're yes. a capitalist. Let's take the United States and make it a company. Let's say we're well, a corporation. If you own 90% of the wealth, 1% owns 90% of the wealth, they should pay 90% of the taxes. Because if I own my own company, if I made a profit, I, 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 I get richer from it. But when I had debt, I couldn't only pay, you know, they said, you know, Rush Limbaugh used to get on and say, 1% of the country pays 50% of the debt. Yes, they pay 50% of the debt. I would love in my company to have to only pay 50% of my debt. But there I you go. <laughs> all that because, 
yeah, if we're capitalists and we believe this is a company, then you know they'll say, they'll say oh, fifty percent of the people hardly even pay taxes or pay no taxes. Well, those people don't have it. They, they don't even have a, a percent of a percent, of, a thousandth percent of a stock. You know, they don't, exactly. they don't have a, a full share of stock in this company. And so basically, this treat it as if you're a capitalist. And OK, and they talk about that. Well, you, we can't bankrupt the rich. And stuff, but we're not going to bankrupt the rich. Now we need to look at cuts like in the military or in, in some social programs. I'm more of a moderate than a Republican or Democrat. OK, then we can look at cuts if you want to look at cuts. But as far as income coming to to, uh, to pay debts and pay deficits, if you own your own company, if you own 90 percent of the stock, you are responsible for 90 percent of the debt of that company. Richard, you know what? You show you show that you are a responsible person, sir. That's what you show. And by the way, I never call myself a capitalist. I call myself a free enterpriser. And based on how you have just spoken, you are a free enterpriser. At some other show, I'm going to define why I don't call myself a capitalist because I love humanity and I, I love exactly what you have said there. You show that you're a thinking person that... Be- Capitalism, capitalism is bastardized. Cap, if you, if you, if, you know, the true capitalism, you take care of the workers. The, you, you, you don't let Exxon and Mobil join together when you get Exxon Mobil as one big company, then BP Amico, and then uh, you know Texaco Chevron. You let these billion dollar companies join together. Why? You know, the billion dollar companies. <laughs> you got the Brother, I, appre- I, I got to go. I got to go now, Richard. Um, look, I've gotten some great calls today. And I thank guys like yourself because, again, you show that um, you specifically uh, illustrate a lot of what I'm talking about with the way that you presented that, my friend. Thank you so kindly for calling. Please keep listening. Just real quick, I think real quick. I think most Republicans consider themselves capitalism. I've had this argument. I'm in the oil field with a lot of Republicans, and once I make this argument and say, "Are you a capitalist? Do you believe in capitalism?" Now tell me why the rich people don't pay their fair share. If they, if this is the co- this, 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 this just buy this company as stockholders. The super rich have most of the stock. They need to pay the tax. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Rich, you have a great day, Richard. It was a, a it was great hearing you. All right, you take care, my friend. Uh, you too. Bye. Bye. All right, folks, we're coming close to the end of the program. And we didn't get, I, I, I had all of this Powell memo that I wanted to go through that I, I, you know, we covered some of the issues with the people that I ca- that called in, but we'll cover that maybe tomorrow. Like I said, this is your show and you can call in and change the show at will. I hope we all learn from each other in this one and you know we'll continue to do this because again we have to have sensible conversation so that people would make sensible choices anyhow i gotta get out of here howard gave me the cue so um my name is egberto willis this is politics done right and you guys know how i end this baby i am what out we spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.